past six years, I've seen a lot. I've talked to a lot of people with more experience and knowledge than myself, and importantly, I've listened. Now, though, it's my turn to speak some hard truths that collectively I think that everyone here knows, perhaps has not been able to admit out loud. So I'm here to bring you a geochemistry therapy session where we reject dogma and bag terms, like no structure in geological models and the word sericite, particularly sericite. In fact, as part of our therapy today, each time you hear me say something specific, like muscovite or illite, graphite or natural alienite, acknowledge it. As a reminder to yourselves and to our group that from this moment on, we reject speaking in bag terms because as geochemists and mineral hobbyists, we know we have the tools to reserve geofantasy for the geophysicists because we're providing our 3D modelers with data so that they can make data-driven models and we can contribute to our teams by helping them make data-driven decisions. So ciao, Sarasite, and bienvenido, Minka Blanca, Elitha, y Morelanitha. These next few slides I want to acknowledge for context of where the Caspici Porphyry is located as well as published information on it. So here we can see that Caspici is a gold copper porphyry located in the Maracunga belt of northern Chile at approximately 4,200 to 4,500 meters above sea level. The porphyry deposits of the Maracunga belt typically only contain gold, however, Caspice contains gold plus byproduct copper potential. Caspice is a telescoped porphyry system, so in other words, it has epithermal gold style mineralization and alterations superimposed on the porphyry style mineral assemblages. The next two slides are taken from Silito et al. 2013. I want to draw everyone's attention to the sub-horizontal volcanic classics and sedimentary host rocks, as well as five discrete porphyry intrusions. The deposit is characterized by a central gold copper zone and hosted in diorite to quartz diorite porphyry stocks. The observed alteration has particularly aggressive boundaries and geometry, but in general we are looking at potassic, potassic calcic, chlorite sericite, propylitic, and advanced archaeolic alteration, as well as two major reaction fronts the base of the leach cap and sulfate fronts. The title of this slide is incredibly important. Just as Silito's porphyry copper deposit model was revolutionary, so is the model presented by Haley et al. in 2015, in particular because it's more specific. There are mineralogical assemblages and a spectral index for white mica. However, let's push ourselves past this and take a look at the telescoping in the Caspice gold copper porphyry. In the following work, we are using a combination of hyperspectral imaging, some limited four acid geochemistry, and structural data. This is not by any means a definitive model, but rather a journey through the alteration mineralogy, assemblages, and lithogeochemical patterns that, with project geologists involved, could be something spectacular. So let's look at my favorite drill hole in the core scan data that I've seen. It's the most beautiful cross-section of a porphyry epithermal system. Hey Sam, thanks for handing the floor to me. For those that have never seen hyperspectral core imaging, this is certainly a treat, as it's my favorite porphyry cross-section. These minerals have names, textures, and stories of their own. They have this excellent iron oxide zone, but this iron oxide zone, it also has montmorillonite in it, has some dickite, kaolinite, alienite, perophyllite, a little bit of gypsum, and even some muscovite towards the bottom of it. So it's more than iron oxide, right? And as we travel down hole in the system, we have dickite that's juxtaposed with kaolinite. What's going on? Alienite, dominant zones, perophyllite dominant zones, some gypsum that's interspersed until finally we truly get down into where our white mica zone really actually starts, which is actually a bit further down. Probably more, I would say, that zone starting here, about 430 meters depth. So we have a pretty sizable advanced argillic and super gene iron oxide zone. But like I said, taking the time to get to know your minerals, getting to know where, who they're co-occurring with, this is what it's all about. And interestingly, I will say that these minerals that we're seeing over here, they come back. So don't forget about our friend Parapholite, Kaolinite, Dickite. Stay tuned. Now heading out of these advanced argillic minerals, we find a lot of this featureless slope aspectral mineral group. And all this is is really just a mixture of anhydrous quartz and anhydrous feldspar. It's difficult to say exactly what is here, just because we don't have any boots on the ground to confirm any of the mineralogy. Potentially there could be some more definition, but really with hyperspectral mineralogy, this is gonna stay this the same big class. 
Perhaps though, looking at the rocks, you might find some silicification and that could be really telling for a deposit like this. We also see here a bunch of different gypsum horizons, which I want to point out. So it's not really clear where necessarily our, our sulfate front necessarily starts. Although I would venture to say that it's probably starting about here at 630 meters depth. And I would also just like to note that gypsum and hydrate, you can't tell them apart with hyperspectral, just because as soon as gypsum is exposed uh, to water, drilling fluids, for instance, or in hydrate rather, it, it turns out to gypsum. What else is interesting here? So we have this muscovite zone that starts to grade into this illite plus chlorite zone, starting about down here. Something that I wanna note is that I have magnetite up over here because we do see magnetite coming in um, pretty high up in these zones. It could, it doesn't necessarily have to be uh, secondary, right? Um, it could just be, this is a magnetite rich layer in here. Potentially there could be more magnetite, but in hyperspectral, if it's really finely grained, it can be very difficult to pull it apart. So now continuing down the horizon, oh, hello, epidote. So yeah, we have some epidote in here, which is interesting. And again, all these things are really important for people to know and to understand in the context of the department. So right now, not knowing that there's epidote here maybe necessarily doesn't mean anything, but it's pretty interesting. Okay, so then continue to move down. Okay, wow, we have a lot more episode here. But then, oops, this is interesting. We have those biotide iron carbonate uh, area. Got another little horizon here. Iron carbonate, biotide amphibole. But really what I'm getting at is once we start to get down here, where we get into this really nice biotide amphibole zone. And then this continues to go uh, on for, for quite some time. I think the, the total depth of this hole is something like a thousand. 100 meters or something. Next up though, just talking about the retrograde. There's likely some retrograde chloride in the biotite amphibole zone. Also there's a late stage, as we can see, Montmorillonite event. This is pretty common, we see it in porphyries. And I just want to point out here that these systems are complicated. Something that you might not expect to find so deep, but um, it's definitely here, is, let's go and pull up some peropolite and oh, two in here. So something unexpected, you can always, Look forward to the unexpected when working with hyperspectral mineralogy, how you can really just appreciate just the complexity of these textures. You know, what would you expect when you looked in here? I don't quite know what to say other than it's probably not what I thought it would be. So here you can see that there's uh, some gypsum sprinkled in, you have muscovite, you have illite, this is all kaolinite and brown. And then you have iron carbonate, everything intermingled. And it's really up to the geologist now to figure out what's up from down. I'm going to hand it back to Sam now so she continued to show more ways that she looked at the data. But really, all this is to say is that ore systems are complicated, and it's a time to acknowledge that the reign of the cartoon and scientific journal articles is over. I'm going to be mostly silent for this, except for when I narrate how beautiful this system is. Here I'm using numerical modeling feature in LeafRog to look at broad trends in the data. So the question that we can ask ourselves are, what are some of the broad trends in the data? So here what we're going to be looking at are broad trends in the mineral compositions, which uses the mineral's wavelength parameters in one of its diagnostic absorption features. So we have alunite, so we have alunite, the 1480 uh, wavelength feature, we're going to have amphiboles coming up. There's also the grade shell that I put in for reference. This is amphibole at the 2380 nanometer feature. And this is the cross section of the amphibole wavelength. Here we're looking at chlorite 2250 nanometers. Superimposed there in red is the copper greater than 0.2% shell. Now this is the biotite 2250 nanometer feature. 
Again, the copper, Grachel, and red. And finally, we're looking at tourmaline, 2340 nanometer wavelength with the copper shell. And here is the white mica, the commonly thought of 2200 nanometer wavelength feature. And this is a combined model with uh, the copper grade shell. So something to think about here is, are we too close to determine the efficacy of these features as pathfinders? Is this gonna be helpful towards pinpointing different generations of copper or gold? And I think what we saw just here in the copper just now is that looking for fungite in the white mica wavelength feature is not always the case for high grade copper zones. So just a few things to think about. Previously, we had a look at mineral predominant zones, but what of where all these minerals uh, coexist? So this here on the right is a UMAP for dimension reduction. Um, and then we use clustering using a density-based scan to view the mineral assemblages and the Kispichi hyperspectral imaging data. I don't have time necessarily to describe all these things, but just think of this as a domaining exercise. And really just how do we look at 35 minerals simultaneously? And importantly, when looking at this now um, in, in three dimensions, does this enhance our knowledge of broad alteration patterns? And what you can see here would be these different mineral domains. Next question is going to be combining these alteration clusters and the ore body shell. And the question here is, do the copper and, alteration and uh, gold shells differ? Are they relatively the same in terms of major mineralogy? And importantly, how can this information be used throughout the mining value chain to inform decisions? Transitioning a bit here, we're going to use some geochemistry in some really straightforward and simple ways. This one is to address the reaction fronts that were noted by Silito et al. So sulfur total typically comes standard with a four acid ICPMS suite. Using bivariate and ternary diagrams, like we have iron copper sulfide speciation can be approximated. Um, but there is a deeper story here with the mineralization looking at other trace elements. But here I'm going to pull a corporate line and say that this is unfortunately not my story to tell. But important lesson that speciating sulfides either like this or the hand lens is typically not enough. And so here when we just take a look at this, you can see that in some of these uh, colors, what I tried to pull out here, where this would be a bornite calcopyrite mixture. In this dark blue, the lighter blue would be um, calcopyrite. Uh, here we have a pyrite calcopyrite mixture in purple, more calcopyrite in this, um, in this uh, yellowish color, uh, and in the orange, more of a perhaps of a sulfate that I help, uh, was helped pull out um, in here in the bivariate diagram. And then lastly, um, this would be more of maybe some iron oxide with very little sulfur content. And so in this view, we're just looking at these mineralization fronts uh, downhole, um, whereas we have in these um, this light blue, we have the calcopyrite. In the, the purple, we have the pyrite calcopyrite mixture and very little, but we do in the dark blue have some uh, boronite calcopyrite mixtures from the geochemistry. And this here is our uh, 
copper shell. The last little bit of geochem I was able to pull from this data set was to look at see if I could map some lithology changes within the geochemistry and structural data. Really, I have this in here just to make the point that logging consistently is complicated, especially when there are large teams with multiple shifts and when there's a lack of control on the logging codes. So using geochemistry and the available structural data, a little geochemical model can start to paint a picture that is very different than the cross sections slide that we saw in slide three with the sub-horizontal basal layers and sub-vertical finger porphyries. It's not to say that one is right or wrong, but that geochemists working in tandem with geologists is crucial. And one last comment for this slide is that today it's relatively easy to improve your model structure, veins, brushes, and other textures. Uh, options uh, for this include machine learning with hyperspectral imaging and photography, and these can help to map and categorize these features. And there's also a lot of geotech options on the market now, so definitely orient your core. And what I want to leave everyone with is to look at one of the lithogeochem layers that's a bit more uh, in detail to see if there's a potential story in our mineralogy. So here, what we're wondering, is there a relationship with a tourmaline and, and a copper mineralizing event? So here we have the gold um, vest from Leapfrog. And this is the copper uh, shell. Um, everything inside is in dark red. Everything on the outside of that copper shell is in this blue color. And these are the two shells together. Pink is gold and red is copper. And now for my question, which is, is there a relationship with tourmaline and a copper mineralizing event? And so this is the, um, this is a, a, um, a shell here that contains, um, this is a lithogeochemical shell, but also it just maps really beautifully um, also this tourmaline. This is just a numerical model of tourmaline. And here's a combined model of tourmaline and lithology from our lith model. And then this is, goes right through the heart of the system and potentially is this related to one of the mineralizing events? And that's really just the question that we have here. But really the other question we have and something that would be really easy having the hyperspectral imaging is what is its texture and what minerals is tourmaline associated with? And so that's where we're gonna go next. So looking at the texture at first, I thought maybe it'd be uh, veined or be part of a breccia, but actually, and this is of the area where it is, um, it's actually just kind of happy hanging out in the matrix a bit. Um, there doesn't really seem to be a clear association with it. Uh, sometimes it looks like it's part in, in veins on the outside of veins. Um, sometimes a bit more massive in the matrix, and that's kind of how it looks throughout the entire um, run uh, of core in this area. So, so yeah, not clear and why it's important also to have uh, your geologist on board when you're trying to figure this all out. And here you can see the texture in the assemblage. So here's the mineralogical class map. In this brown color is all kilonite. Uh, this darker brownish red is the tourmaline. You have hydrated silica in this greenish color. Alienite, interestingly, for how, how deep it is, there is some alienite. You can see it up over here a little bit. Uh, white mica is all in these uh, blues. And then you have that featureless slope uh, mineral, which could be possibly either anhydrous quartz or anhydrous feldspar. So really here, there's not much more to say other than to look at every avenue and follow it up. And perhaps there is here a mineralizing event where tourmaline is important. And when I noticed the similarity, I immediately rushed to see if we had maybe a Los Bronces-like high-grade tourmaline matrix breccia. I was perhaps wrong in this, but the story may not necessarily end here. So this is Caspiche's take on the Haley et al. model. Here, just really quick, we have the different mineral uh, predominance zones, illite in blue, muscovite in purple. Uh, the biotite is in this reddish color, amphibole in the green, brophyllite up here with alienate up here in the pinks and the, 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 uh, the yellow. 
And then our copper shell is, is this in red. So the envelopes are not completely as promised, um, but they actually made for a good approximation. The white mica particularly is, does not follow the, this Haley model, but it's not anything approaching simple. So I can wax poetic for the trends that we saw in Caspiche for another 20 minutes, but our organizing committee would definitely frown upon this. The take here is that hydrothermal alteration is messy. And while exploration models are great initial guides, it's important for data-driven mineralogy and chemistry to help us unravel each project story and metallurgy, further bolstering these models with strong field observations and ancillary data sets. So I'd like to thank here Norte Abierto for providing the data for this talk and for being so accommodating during the work. I'd also really like to thank Leapfrog Geo and IOGAS for supporting new consultants. And finally, to Julia Oliveira, McLean Trott, Tom Carmichael, and Pepo Fontanalba for lending your ideas and your expertise. Thank you.